Welcome to Blue Sky, Refocusing, Salon from Anywhere. Um, thank you all for coming and participating. And we are recording this session. Um, so feel free to recommend it to other folks, but also be aware that we are doing the recording. Um, and it, this is like all of the sessions going to be highly participatory. So there will be the option of either using the chat or using the raise hand feature. And then um, you will you will be called upon and unmuted. Um, and I want to, as always, thank everybody at Blue Sky for making this happen. Um, the amazing Amanda, who is really doing a lot of the producing of this, but, um, but the whole team, Molly, Sammy, Yu Yang, have all been really fantastic to work with. Um, and it's funny because I put a little intro in not knowing how many folks would, would, would need to hear about Blue Sky, but I think this is a group that is largely blue sky aware, so I might just plunge in. Um, and it's been interesting to do these programs online because they have evolved so much, uh, both in terms of what we're all going through, but also what's happening in the world around us. Um, so we, uh, when I do programs in the gallery, they're always focused at, on a couple things. One is to build community, talking about photography and often talking about it in conjunction with poetry, which is what we'll be doing tonight. But um, it's also uh, focused on helping bring more diverse perspectives into the gallery. Um, and that's one of the pleasures about bringing in the poetry is that I can choose stuff that either aligns really closely with what's on the walls or that broadens our understanding because it's divergent from what's on the walls or sometimes a combination of those things. Um, so we've been figuring out how to keep doing that when we can't all be in one place to, um, to find the ways to build community as we talk about. So far it's only been photography, but today we'll have the poetry as well. Um, and I should say a bit about how I came up with tonight's topic because the kind of the first three of these sessions really unfolded as a series and then Molly said, oh, this is good. Let's keep doing it. Let's make it a, a regular salon. And I think many of us have been thinking a lot about policing, about the prison industrial complex, about the carceral state, and all of those both depend on and perpetuate stereotypes that white America has particularly of black men, though not exclusively um, of black men, but that even when white America is celebrating black men, it's usually in a very limited way and it's often about performance for white audiences. Um, and so I wanted to push us away from that and really think about the reality of loving and nurturing and black fatherhood. So that's like the official up in my head why I came up with this topic, but I'll let you in on a secret, which is that in my heart, it's also that Zunli's photographs are incredibly beautiful and incredibly powerful. And when they were up in the gallery for a whole bunch of reasons having to do with mundane scheduling, I didn't get to do a program. So I've kind of wanted to revisit them and this has been a great excuse. Um, and I've paired them tonight with poems from this fabulous book, the Book of Hours, or it's just called Book of Hours by Kevin Young. Um, Kevin is an amazingly prolific poet and cultural critic. He runs the Schomburg Center, which is part of the New York Public Library. Um, he's written a ton of books of poetry. Uh, he's a poetry editor of New Yorker, the New Yorker magazine. He's also, as I said, written books of cultural criticism. He was also like a year or two behind me in college and we lived in the same dorm, so I'm a little um, slightly resentful of how incredibly prolific he is. But I will say about this book, um, this book, his poems, both about the death of his father and about the birth of his son. So it's about both being a son, losing a father and becoming a father through the birth of a son. Um, and I've taught it before and I really do love this book very much. When I was choosing the poems for us to look at tonight, I realized that there is so much grief in the world right now and a lot of trauma and a lot of re-traumatizing, even as we say people's names, even as we talk about wanting to end white supremacy and all kinds of racist brutality, there's just so much grief that I thought it would be nice to hold the space tonight for something that is more focused on the loving and the nurturing and the positive. So we aren't gonna really look at the poems that are about his father and his loss of his father, um, but the book is fantastic and you can all get a copy of it um, and enjoy it the whole way through. Um, 
And I thought I might steal a little something to get us started from uh, any number of protests that I've been at where um, obviously we've, there's been a lot of chanting of say her name, say his name, say their name and particular names. But I've also been at some protests where each person is just articulating a name in memoriam of somebody who died um, usually through police violence or other forms of racist violence. And I wanted us to start in tribute to that, but moving slightly differently. I didn't warn Amanda I was going to do this. Watch poor Amanda. Uh, um, but maybe uh, we will in a moment all unmute and take a little pause to each say the name of a Black man who you admire as a father. So take a moment and put that person in your head so that we can say the names. And I have to say, I was at um, uh, a gathering in which we were given names to say, but not a particular order to say them. So people just sort of spoke as they found the space to speak. And there was some overlap, but actually it turned out to be really beautiful in its own way to do that. So uh, I am going to ask Amanda to unmute us all. Oh, some of you may have to unmute yourselves as well, depending on what your setup is. I have to ask everybody, and so everyone should be asked now. Thanks. And obviously, nothing is compulsory, so if you don't want to participate, don't. But um, looks like Nolan, Ken, and the mysterious person known as APAD, and Amanda are also <laughs> muted. Okay. Um, so I will start, but then just fill the space as you will. Um, and I'll start with Brian Green. Carl Banks. Barack Obama. John Lewis. Adrian Henderson. Dave Chappelle. Rod McDonald. For folks who are just joining us, we're all um, just sharing a name of a black man who we admire as a father. Even George. Sorry to repeat, but Barack Obama, for sure. <laughs> All right, folks seem to be getting quiet. Um, so unless anybody else is waiting to fill the space, maybe go, go back to um, having folks muted. Um, but I will... Um, so we're about to plunge in. We're going to look at some photographs. We're going to look at some poems. But I thought maybe we would want to just connect first. Uh, how is it when you're looking at a photograph that you read that photograph? Like, what are, what is the actual process of reading a photograph involved? And folks can either say something in the chat or use the raise hand feature. Um, and uh, Amanda or Zemi will unmute you. I'm pulling your teeth from the uh, I would say first and foremost, I mean the subject and then the, um, the genre of the photographs. What do you mean by genre? Genre, I would say um, the, the, ca um, the category, am I looking at the landscape? If I'm looking at the landscape, what kind of landscape am I looking at? Am I looking at the traditional landscape? Or oh, am I looking at a landscape that that, that that is pushing the boundaries. Yeah. 
looks like Marsha and then Chuck have some things to say right after. This. And I think Sharon as well. Marsha's still muted. Sorry. I'm unmuted. Um, when I look at a photograph, it's my first thing is how does it hit me in my gut? Um, which is what's my first emotional read? And after that, then I can step back and look at some of the more tangible factors, like the gentleman who, who just went before me. But um, it's, for me, it, it's very much, you know, does it hit me in the gut? And um, in that same way, for me, I just really want to be surprised on some level. And it could be from a lot of different directions. I just want to be surprised. Chuck? Um, I would say I like to imagine either the photograph is, the scene in the photograph is coming to me or I am inserting myself into it. So for me, when I first look at the photograph, it's sort of, I want it to be part of my world or become part of its world. And that's really interesting. And it reminds me of an exercise I've done with primarily with historical photographs that have people in them. I've asked participants to all like assume the pose of one of the people in the photographs. And it's really interesting because it's a different thing to look at somebody and try and um, see what, what you are presuming about their emotional state or other aspects of them based on the position they're, they're in. And it's totally different once you actually go into their position to see how it feels to, to assume that um, stance. Uh, and I think there might have been somebody else who had a hand up. I think, oh, look. So Susan, Laura, and I can't see if there's any other hands waving, but Susan, why don't you want to go next? Me? Is it me? Oh, yeah, Laura? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'm on or not. Um, you know, I, I, it's almost like there could be a word for this, but it's uh, not the first awareness that I'm looking at something. It's the, the next one. You know what I'm saying? What, what makes me curious or interested just to stay with it. I guess that's it because there's times I just want to flick it away too. So just the, the next the next engagement, I guess. So there's, it's been interesting because we've heard sort of the, that first emotional response, that sense of surprise, but yeah. also a more analytic, like is it, what genre does it fall into? What's the subject? How might I relate to it? And you're also saying like, what gets me past all of those initial reads, right? It, it happens all the time when I'm in Blue Sky or another gallery mm -hmm. or museum looking at work and I think, will I remember this picture a year from now or 10 years from now? And we all can think of shows that we've seen however many years ago where there's just like an image that is still with you. I think that's what you're getting at. Um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, and sometimes it's almost like we start making a narrative. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it. And Susan, you're unmuted now. Uh, uh, so I like to look and I like to think about what questions the photograph might pop up, what, what questions might pop up about the photograph. And if I don't really understand what I'm looking at, I want to look further and, and investigate the photographer and what intentions are. But I love just the visual path through somebody else's image, um, which sometimes is easy to read and sometimes is more mysterious. It, that was like, if I could have put an audience plant in, that would have been the one I would have chosen in part because one of the things that's great about these conversations is that we can help we can ask those questions and answer those questions for each other. That the idea isn't that we each have our own notion of the photo, but that we're building meaning and understanding together. And I got to say, like, at these sessions, I, we've done photos that I looked at for a long time to choose. I knew what I thought about them. I looked at them some more. And then in the course of the conversation, I learned to see new things in them or make new connections around them because of what participants have said. Um, was Jane also waiting? And you had your hand up early. Amanda has to unmute. Maybe she I has to ask. You have to unmute yourself, I think. She should have gotten a prompt. Mm. 
Jane, we can't hear you. I think you need to unmute on your end. <laughs> Jane, you can try holding down the space bar. That's a good tip. Ooh! Wait. No, you, have to, you have to keep holding it down as you, as you speak. Oh, OK. I, I keep getting this thing. I have an unreliable connection. <laughs> I, so for me, there's this woo-woo thing of just some kind of magic that isn't a verbal thing. It's a visual thing. And you, look, you see this image, and you know, I'm drawn to it. And then, you know, it can be subject, but also it's comp probably the next is subject, and then, then the third thing is composition, you know, formal composition. But, uh, you know, it's more about the thing that's not as explainable in words. It's just this feeling, this, this visceral feeling. Yeah. Um, and Molly has put something in the chat, which I think is, in some ways brings together a lot of the comments that folks have made. Um, and I will say I'm a little, um, I, I don't necessarily give a lot of context when we're working at things, although obviously you're welcome to bring your own sense of context to what we're doing. Okay, so that's how we read a photograph. Maybe we'll jump into a photograph and then we'll talk a little bit about how to read a poem once we get there. But I think um, I'm just going to go into share screen mode. Da, 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 da. No. All right. So here's our first photo to look at. And just take a moment with it, um, with whatever your approach is. And just notice for a little bit. And maybe think about three things that you're noticing or questions that you have, and then we can use the chat or either the raising of hands to, uh, the, I, think the, I think you have to use the official raise hand feature because we can't see all of you now that I'm showing my slides. Sure. And it looks like Marsha's ready to get us started. And then Chris after that. So, Mar yeah, so I love, this looks like New York to me, um, although it could be somewhere else. And, oh, it does say it's New York. Um, so what I love about this photo is the way um, the protective hand on it, on his son and it, it, it feels like they, it's, they're somewhere on the cusp between he, the, the two of them own the city or the, does the city own them? Is it a challenge that they can, that they're distant from the city up on a roof? Or is it that they're there because it's, they're looking at their dominion? So that was, that was my read. Yeah, I think that those are, um, those are great observations and you already got into that idea of like what is looking at the posture of the subjects and this is such an interesting photo because it could read either way I think Chris was next yeah I mean I, I agree with what Marsha's pointing out obviously that gesture but to me the also the thing that's that's very compelling about it is that as a father he's there doing absolutely nothing else except paying attention to his kid it's the absence of any other intervening priority, I think, that's, that makes it uh, powerful for the kid, you know? It's like, I have your full attention. Right, and that they're both, um, that it really is just the two of them alone in the world, but also the world is really present there to, that they're not isolated in that sense, but that, as you said, there's no distractions. Let's hear from Nolan and then check after that. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of play off Chris, but go the opposite because um, 
if you look at the the line of sight between the two where the father can probably see you know all of the city and the street below and his son is standing with him but if the railings probably you know right beneath his eyes where he can probably not see a whole lot but he's just spending his time with his dad because you know this is their moment but i, I can imagine he probably can't see a whole lot of the city just by standing there where he's at right now yeah and it also means that this is a particular moment in this kid's life that is to say that six months ago he wouldn't have been able to see anything over that wall right yeah. so that it's also there's an implied kind of um passage of time or right. moment of passage there maybe like there's a routine maybe they do this every night or something and he's, he's i love the also the fact he's wearing his martial arts gi like is this what they do after class or before class or right. Um, and I'm going to, uh, oh, Chuck's already unmuted. So why don't we do Chuck and then I'll pull in Molly's comment from the um, chat. I'm not sure if other folks have hands up still. Hey, yeah, we have after that, um, I think Jude and Leland would like to chime in. This, okay. is, yeah. this is such a beautiful image. So I, first of all, when I see this, there are two things that come to mind. One is there's a concept in uh, landscape ar architecture called uh, prospect and refuge. And it's about that the places that people feel the most comfortable in are where you have a view of something, but you're also safe at the same time. And this wall in this is kind of like, to me can read like a, a walled garden. Like they're at, they're at home. We, I mean, I'm, I'm a, when I look at this, I think this is, this is the roof of the building where they live. And you also get, just get the sense of the, the vastness of the city and their, their place in it. And the other concept that comes to mind is there's this thing from uh, Aristotle where your place in the world is the interior boundary of all the things that are not you. Um, so that to me, this feels like they're, they're, you, they're present is we're physically in the, in the image as well. They're right in the center, right? Like here they are and these people with the whole city around. And they're the only people we see in the image and you can see a car on the freeway to the, in the left but that's that's it like here they are humans in the vastness of this city it's beautiful yeah and um to it's interesting to hear that the historical read that you've put on it and similar to what um molly had put in the chat about perspectives and the human forms in relation to the expanse of the city and all of these shapes too right like there's so many angles and lines here that I think it also underscores what uh, from the Renaissance forward has taught us to think of as like perspectival points, which are all in some ways, um, or many of them pointing in towards these two figures. So it's really centering their experience. Um, and uh, Doris used in the chat, used the term anchored, which I think connects to what Chuck was saying at, at about the same time. Um, and yeah, and the sense of, um, protectiveness as opposed to being walled in, although we started with a comment that said, well, it's hard to tell whether they own the city or the city owns them. Ben, did you want to remind us who's up next? Yeah, Jude is next and unmuted, and then Leland is up next. Thanks. Hi, so I find there's a, a bit of tension in this image, you know, the photographer, so we as the viewer are stepped back from the corner of this wall so we're in a slightly safe position or a safe position whereas they're right at the corner right up against the wall and it's a little scarier for them but somehow just the father's arm around the child negates that they seem to be in a safe place and uh, I, I'm taken with with the perspective as well how the wall leads us into the corner and, and the two people and how the um, the horizon line, even the buildings that are immediately in front of us seem somewhat flat because they're at the same height. So, so the wall itself or, or the buildings, the roofs themselves are all sort of a straight line. So it's almost like a backdrop, you know, a very flat backdrop to, to these two characters. Yeah, and it's interesting, I mean, the, photographers amongst us would also think about um, 
how focus drops out as you move further and further away from the figures, right? So what's crisply in focus and what is less in focus and what is more faded but still visible in terms of the skyline of the city, which I think fits Jude with what you were just saying. But also you're right, I feel no fear for this child. Like, yeah. like you know, and I can be a nervous now, like don't step back from the wall, careful little one, right? You feel no fear. And even just thinking about how the position of the father's Gerald is his name, of his shoulders, he doesn't feel fear, right? He, his stance is a relaxed care arm, not a look out, be careful arm. And, and even if you weren't looking at that that closely, I think we were reading it. Um, and who is waiting next? Leland is up next and then Sharon after that. You know, I, 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 there's a lot about this photograph that I find really interesting. First, I, I, I really am amazed at how without the people, it's kind of a nice um, cityscape, um, which, which is a very interesting thing because portraiture is about isolation and what they're doing with the brick wall and showing us the backs of the subjects is, is kind of showing us literally they are in a corner. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing photographs of, of black fathers and sons without thinking that there is something special um, that is being said by this. Uh, and it's, it's very protective, but it's also that the subjects are in this corner um, and they're looking out at sort of the mean streets of New York. Uh, and, and the fact that it's a black and white photo as well, to me, is a, it, I see contrast much better than color. Um, so the contrast to the leading lines of the top of the wall, everything is symmetrical up to the subjects. Um, and then the city just unfolds in front of them. And there is something really special about just seeing this protective stance that the father has holding his son, looking out at the city, which is not that inviting a place, but is their home. It, well, and it is, it's a, it is a city of, um, you know, New York is a city of great possibility and great potential, and also a city that can be incredibly cruel in many respects and, in, and incredibly alienating. So a number of folks have talked about um, what it means that, that they're the only real human figures here. I mean, Chuck noted that there's like one car you can sort of see and a roadway in the distance, but um, is that a sense of how special they are and centering them or does it make us feel disconnected from community? And I think that that fits. And, and certainly Zunli, not all of his photographs are about um, black fathers and sons, but this is from a body of work that is devoted to that. So I think he is very conscious of the fact that these are images that we don't have enough of in our culture and that, um, that we always come to them with the reading as Chris observed in the chat about like, what danger means. You know, I, I write and teach a lot about uh, slavery, and I used to s say, you know, imagine having a child who you love but can't protect. And I realized that it's ludicrous to say that as though that was only something that was true in the past. We know what the level of danger is for kids of color, particularly black kids in this country, and what that means to love and parent a child. Um, uh, I think there was somebody else that uh, Amanda said was waiting to speak. Yes, Sharon is up next. <clears throat> um, well, you know, um, I mean, you can tell by the apartments around there that, um, you know, it's a, it's it got to be some kind of really intense place to live. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, poverty, you know, levels of poverty in a way. and. Um, I mean, I've lived downtown in an urban setting for many years, and actually the roof is like the sanctuary. It's the way you can get above all of that. And so I think it makes it pretty exciting, like, um, I think, to see them there. I also like the fact that the dad's head is above that level of those buildings that go sliced across, that, you know, he's above that. and. Um, um, it's very important to get up there in the city, to get up from under, you know, I mean, literally, and um, it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, there are very few places you can be in New York 
where you don't feel the city rising up around you. And certainly they're not at the tallest building in New York City. We can see that, but there's nothing immediately around them. Right. That is squishing. That dwarfs them. Right, exactly. Right. Um, are, are there other thoughts or questions folks have around this particular image before we look at another? No one else has their hand raised at the moment. All right, so maybe I will click us forward one. And again, let's just take a, a few minutes with this to think about what we're noticing or what questions we might have. And whenever somebody's ready to, to jump in with an observation or a question, either with a hand raised or in the chat, um, looks like maybe Marsha and then Molly. Yes. So um, oh, there's such a strong narrative in this picture. Um, it feels like a divorced dad um, uh, and his daughter. And you can see in her face that she's like, why dad, why are we saying goodbye? And that you can also see that sort of regret in his face. I love the fact that her little hand is on the, the windowsill, but it's not going up to meet his, his hand. It's like he hasn't gone far enough, is kind of the narrative. Um, so that, that was my takeaway. I, I will say that's, I mean, that's a possible narrative, although we don't know anything about their family or this moment, um, but it's interesting what what it says about what we bring to our interpretation. Um, and I think Molly is waiting next, and then I'll read um, from what George said in the chat. Um, what I think about in looking at this photograph is that the notion of of the gaze or a gaze. Um, I mean, both of these figures are are gazing, gazing at at each other gazing out, we are gazing at the, at the photograph, perhaps trying to construct a narrative. Um, we think about the male gaze or the white gaze onto um, the, the black story that's unfolding. Um, so that's, that's what I saw when I, when I first looked at this. And um, it made me want to sort of peer deeper into their, into their eyes to actually kind of connect with their their phys their physical gaze yeah they're really closely connected through looking at each other and like if you think about i mean i suppose one could use whatever kind of lens to get in close but it feels like we are really close to them and they are completely unaware of slash uninterested in our presence that that they are in their own emotional world um and I, it's interesting too to think about because uh she's looking up and he's looking down. I mean, those are just facts because he's standing outside the car that she's in. Um, they're logistical realities, but I think it also can push us to start adding narrative about her longing or her hope or his sadness, which may not actually be accurate. It may just be that sometimes somebody, something is below my line of gaze, so I have to look down, and sometimes it's above my line of gaze, and I have to look up. And I should say, I also cheated a little bit. Um, Zun Lee has long titles for these photographs, and they just look messy on the slides. So I just put in the names of the individuals and the location, but the full title of this, as it appears, at least on the Blue Sky site, is, um, something about Billy Garcia and daughter Esmeralda playing at a gas station, Bronx, New York. So they're having like this moment of play maybe while they, uh, you know, in other states, the driver of the vehicle often gets out of the car to fill the car with gasoline. I know Oregonians may be shocked to hear this, but it does happen. So he may also be filling the car with gas as they're playing this game up through the, the window. I'm gonna um, take a moment to just go 
into what folks have been putting in the chat, because Doris noted about um, the light and the gentleness of the gesture. Um, and there's this sense of close connection, but we also kind of want to read more about what the emotions, especially the father has. Um, and again, right, this, uh, Susan observes that tactile sense, right? It's really interesting to see people touching through a window because, um, because I think in some ways it also makes us conscious of the fact that uh, in the same way that the glass is separating them, there's the, the lens separating us. Um, Sharon wants to chime in. Yeah, please do. Um, what, what do you think of a title that perhaps gives too much away? Because now I'm upset about hearing the title. Like I'm going like, well, wait a minute. That took away all the drama for me. Like, you know, what? we get to make up our own stories. So it's kind of interesting because sometimes those we want those titles and sometimes we don't. And I don't know, it's just, it's interesting. Well, and I think it's interesting to interrogate also whether we whether we love the more information we get or or it upsets us because we were creating a really different narrative and what had shaped our assumptions and our narratives. Chris put in the chat that Zun, as a photographer, spends an incredible amount of time with each of these families because he really wants, as Chris put it, to be able to disappear so that they're not self-conscious about him taking photographs. And the pictures, I think, are amazing for that reason. Um, but it also uh, means that he, he knows them better than we do. And yet we want, we want to create these stories around them. Um, is there anybody else with a hand up, Amanda? Yeah, like Chuck would like to say something next. I think, first of all, to me, this almost looks like a religious photograph that like, there's a, there's a holiness really on both sides of the, of the windows. It, to me, it's just very spiritual. And I think that formally, if you look at the line from her eye to his eyes, it's pretty much at a right angle to that line of what I guess is the car window or the car door. So it looks like the door is open. You can kind of see on the top. But anyway, that, 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 that cross, literally of the, you know, I'm not saying that it's a Christian picture at all, but just that the way that it's laid out is really in, in, interesting that it has these two lines in it that are pretty much at, at right angles. I think too, um, you know, we talked about the, the fact that in the last photo it was just this father and son and here there's another car in the background. So the closeness of other people is maybe more represented, but it's like, I can't take my eyes off of these humans. I, it's hard for me to force myself as I'm reading this picture to look at the other pieces of the picture. It, I think again, has something to do with what's in focus, what's out of focus, where the light is hitting, but also um, the intensity of the emotional moment. Are there other folks who are waiting? No, not at the moment. I just saw Jane Beebe. Jane, do you wanna chime in now? Okay, is it working now? Yes. Okay, so I don't know if you're uh, familiar with uh, Ennio Mangalare Avale's uh, photograph, The Kiss, um, where he, where it's part of a video, but when we are talking about uh, between the glass, he's, uh, there's a man cleaning the glass. It's a Farnsworth house, which is a glass house, I think, outside Chicago. And it's a glass box. And inside is a woman with um, earphones on and playing music. So, but they have between them this glass and, you know, how much communication goes on between glass, you know, between human beings. And um, I mean, it's very touching, but, you know, they're separated. And my first thought, somebody else said this was, it's, it was a father who was saying goodbye to a shared custody child. And I, that was incorrect, I, because they're at the gas station. But that was my first instinct, like, oh, that sad goodbye of parents who 
have shared custody of their kids. And it's so interesting how easy it is for us to conjure up that narrative oh, and then yeah. be like, oh, wait, where, what, what caused me to, to be here? Yeah. I mean, that's really... Oh, we lost you, Jane. Hit your space bar again, please. It's on. Is it working? Yes. It is. A... Sorry, I have a very, as it keeps on telling me, unreliable <laughs> green flag. Um, yeah, no, that's what's one of the great things about art is the different interpretations that one can bring. And then it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to learn. It's, so maybe that's what's good about having a more explicit title. Like you can look at it and do things and then, you go, oh, well, no, actually it's not about that at all. It's something completely different. So maybe that's a, a, yeah. uh, the vote for a more explicit title, I don't know. <laughs> well, and Marcia has observed in the chat that part of it is also it, that it, it can reveal our own implicit bias, right? I never look at an image of a white father actively parenting and think, oh, it's so great that the prison industrial complex has not disrupted his ability to parent that child, but it's really hard not to carry what, um, not just the truths, but also the prejudices of our culture when we're looking at these images. And I think that's exactly why Zunli spends so much time making these beautiful, beautiful pictures. I'm gonna to jump to something else because Nolan said in the chat, the gaze is very Renaissance or Renaissance as our British friends would say. And Nolan, could you maybe unmute and unpack that for us? What do you mean by that? And then after that, Chris has something to say. Oh no, just the, the softness of their eyes and the eye contact they're making. This seems very like painterly, like Baroque or Renaissance. It's just that the, the soft expressions on their faces to me, like communicating. I don't know, you, I don't see that in paintings anymore. You know, yeah. Yeah, you gotta go back in history to find that contact of emotion. I just wanted to, to chime in with what Lois was saying. I, I heard an interview with a, a black father on the radio the other day where he was saying that, uh, that this woman walked up to him and, and said how she was so happy to see him not abandoning his family. And he, he was like, this was the worst moment of his life practically to be just like, how can you have that assumption of me? Right, right. Like, do we call it a microaggression or a macroaggression? And just even Chuck started us off by saying, you know, that one of the things he thinks about is putting himself in the photo, right? Uh, what is it like to parent in a world where seriously people are walking around thinking about that as a, about me as a parent? Like that, that any good parenting I do is like somebody might congratulate me for not being the terrible parent that they had just would have otherwise just assumed that I was. I mean, it's really something. Um, Amanda, is there anybody else with a hand up? Yes, Sharon. <laughs> um, well, first of all, the composition is so, so beautiful. Just so fantastic. And having the, all that empty space on that one side and then you get, you get the, the gaze gets more of intense boomerang from that empty space on the left. And, that's exciting. And um, I just, I don't know. I have to say that we just, you know, we're not integrated enough. You know, whites and blacks are not integrated enough so that, you know, here we are. I mean, even, I mean, I'm not sure. I kept looking. Is there a black person in the house? I mean, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. Well, you know even the question that I, or the invitation that I started this off with, which was to say the name of a black man you admire as a father. And it, there's nothing wrong with saying Barack Obama. It's not a bad thing, but you know. um, it's interesting how many folks in this group maybe couldn't name somebody that they know personally. And I think that speaks to what you're saying about, um, we live in a country where it's not that there are no spaces in which black people and white people are together, but it's awfully easy through a whole lot of not accidental factors 
for white people not to move around black people and see them in ways that remind us that, oh, look, it's the supermarket, it's the gas station, it's anywhere a human being goes because we're all human beings. Um, Amanda, was there somebody else waiting with, for the hand up? Yeah, Leland is next. I just, you know, I, I'm just listening to everybody and thinking about how uh, as, I mean, well, as white, as a white person, I see this in a, in a kind of a challenging way because it is a moment between a father and his daughter. Um, and there's a lot of possible storylines, but it's just, it's just a moment. And, um, I have to admit, I hear a lot more stories about, you know, young black men and boys and their relationships to their moms than, than young girls and their relationships to their black fathers. And um, it just challenges a lot of those things that I have been exposed to about the black experience that make you stop and kind of question like, why, wait a minute, why don't I hear stories like people talking about their black fathers more, young women talking about their experiences with their fathers, which is, we've, we've kind of become closed off to anything that doesn't fit a certain narrative about about absentee black fathers and the ones that aren't doing that being somehow worthy of mention because they're an exception to something. And this is just one of those quick stories that you see in a moment with a camera that that challenges a lot of those ideas. Right, every family that has a black father has a black father and the question of why there's not more representation of that and also the reality of like, you can look at over policing, you can look at uh, disparate sentencing that we do intentionally as a society, do things that separate black men from their families at a much higher rate than we separate white men from their families. And I think probably we could throw in uh, Latino men and native men as well in that, um, in talking about those, that's what structural racism is. Oh, it's so interesting. We're talking about structural racism. We're talking about implicit bias. I thought we were just talking about some pretty pictures. Oh, wait, we can't do those things separately. Um, I think, is Chris up next? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to say two things quickly. One is I'm, I'm watching uh, The Last Dance, the, the uh, series about uh, Michael Jordan. And absolutely the most important thing in his life was his relationship with his father. And his father was there constantly all the time and it's really what the whole show is about is that when his father was murdered it, it completely undid him and and anyway but I also want to say that in response to talking about the composition of these pictures which we've talked about in every one of Jun's pictures so far this is this is I think becoming a lost art I just had somebody invite me to look at uh, hundreds of one image each by graduating undergraduate and graduate students of photography and i didn't see one well composed picture in the whole bunch i mean people are now i think learning and i'm i'm exaggerating obviously to make a point but i think people are learning photography now by looking at other people's instagram feeds they're not looking at cartier bresson the, the people that we looked at when we were young photographers and i think what we're seeing with with Chun is that there's a power to his pictures because they're well composed in part. And that's the part that I think is becoming rare, unfortunately. Uh, so now that we've had the, uh, in our household, we often say we're working on a musical called Curmudgeon, the musical. <laughs> and so we've had like the, the Curmudgeon interpretation. And this is an interesting question. I think we could bring it back to Nolan's observation about um, a mode that existed in painting and that somebody else put in the chat, it didn't exist before the Renaissance and no one was saying, you don't see it in painting anymore, right? A softness of the gaze. And that's a compositional issue or a compositional choice or a compositional trend that is about how art evolves over time. And this question of what does it mean for people? I mean, in some ways, it's much easier to take a photograph now than it has ever been since there has been photography, which actually isn't all that long. Um, but it's also in some ways harder to take the time with a photograph just because of the devices that people are using. I remember getting my first real camera 
uh, as a high school student and how much work went into composing a photograph. Um, and it's in some ways harder to, to get that access just because the, the, um, the instant photo that you can take with your phone is the way that everybody's getting introduced to it. So um, whether we can say that this is a lost skill in a generation or that a hundred years from now, the way people will look back at the photographs of this time and of the generation that's coming up now and see also things emerging that we can't quite detect yet. Um, is there uh, anything anybody else is waiting to jump in on or ask about this photograph? No hands are currently raised. All right, why don't we go to, I think there's one more before uh, we'll come to a poem. Think about what you're noticing. And feel free to jump in either with a raised hand or in the chat whenever you have a thought or a question you want to share. Looks like Jude is. Um, I think my first sort of initial reaction to this is that there's something really tentative. Like the father is there, but. I'm not sure he wants to be there. What makes you say that? I think perhaps he's looking away from the camera. He's looking away from us, sort of. Looks like he's looking out of a window that maybe he wants to be outside of this space. I think for, for me, one of the ways I read that is there's, there's light out there. Um, and he's looking up, and for me, that reads much more hopefully than it seems to be reading for you. Like looking, looking for a bright future for these children that I'm holding. Yeah, I'm not, sorry, I don't see that. His neck seems to be extended and, yeah. I'll look for the hope. Do other folks have some thoughts they want to share? Nobody's got their hand raised at the moment. I think, again, um, and there is a little bit of a cheat, again, for me knowing the full title, but I will say uh, there's also something about, we know from even what I've put in there, this is a, a, a newborn and then a slightly older daughter. Um, and just having that much baby in your lap, like I feel the warmness of those kids. Um, and he's, uh, his chest is also fully turned towards them, which means his heart is fully turned towards them. Um, and to me, that seems delightful. I also don't know if this picture would work as well if he were facing the same direction as them. I think it would look a little too much Kmart portrait studio. And so part of, uh, who knows how many pictures Zun shot in this particular um, sitting, but that the, um, the look away may also be part of the, uh, the same compositional interest that Chris was just talking about. Amanda, was there somebody else with a hand up? Yeah, Leland is up next. Thank yeah, I was, just, I was just a little shocked at the, at the comment about him wanting to escape because I, I don't get that sense at all, but I, I, I'm very aware and I became very thoughtful as soon as that comment was made of how this is a very close portrait with a wide angle lens that kind of distorts features a little bit. Um, and it, it 
uh, but it, it, it's one of the, it's one of the ones to me that has um, just resonates. I mean, as a father, I've got two daughters and I can just relate to, you know, there are moments where you just sit there with a couple of little kids on your lap and you don't really know what to do. It doesn't mean that it's unpleasant. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, scary, but you really don't know what to do, but just kind of sit there and be in that moment. And that's kind of what this, this reads to me. I actually felt a kind of a sense of connection with the subject just on that, on that. But the, the close, the closeness and the wide angle lens has this strange effect of making you know the side of his nose look larger and his eye look larger and um and it really puts you right in there with them yeah yeah and molly newgard put in the chat i see pride in his pose and i want to her to unmute so because so she can tell us what what's conveying that yeah, and, and actually, as Leland was talking, I was thinking more of like, almost like an, an exhausted pride. Um, I almost see a, a kind of a, a smile or maybe even a smirk sort of emerging on his face. He's, it's almost like, I, I, these, these are my babies, and I'm, um, I, I'm tired as a young new father, especially for the, you know, to the, to the newborn. But um, there's something about, look, look at what I've done, or look at, what I, look at what I've, um, brought into this world and also maybe the combined sort of anxiety with what that means and that sense of responsibility because and for me as a parent i know what that means and he's only at the beginning and it's a long haul um and you know and it's there's probably a sense of of anxiety but also um overwhelming overwhelming pride and i think um even this is one of those places where black and white photography probably creates a nice cheat, right? That um, Guy Jr. and Guy Sr. are both wearing stripy shirts. And if we could see the colors of those shirts, they might not look like they have all that much in common, but the stripiness kind of um, brings them together in the, because in black and white, the colors look like they're the same colors, right? So it's uh, even more attachment between them. Amanda, are there folks waiting with hands up? Yes, um, let's hear from Molly Major next and then Chuck after that. Um, yeah, I just wanted, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that he seems, just from his posture, very relaxed with the children. I can't, you know, think what he's feeling, but also his daughter is leaning into him, into his shoulder. So it seems like a very tight family unit. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Warm, it seems warm to me. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, people have talked a little bit about the lens and the way it, what it uh, foregrounds or what it distorts in here and the bigness of these kids' eyes. I mean, newborns can look like they have huge eyes anyway, but I think that that's also part of the warmth is that we, this is the first picture in which we have eye contact with any of the subjects and it's both of these kids um, looking at us with those big warm eyes. Uh, was Chuck next? I just, has anyone else noticed that baby bottle? It's blowing my mind. Which one? The one right in the back, like, yeah, it's right there in the, on the top of the couch. It's just this object that really stands out. You know, after you look at the people and the light coming in, that's the thing that really, it's this sort of an icon of fatherhood. So what does it convey for you? Or what is, what's your emotional or formal response to it? The formal response, I don't really know. But in terms of like, obviously, he has to use this object and others like it many times a day to like feed little, little guy junior, right? But it's sort of matter of fact, and it's in the background, but yet it's sort of in the, it, it, it's, it's, it's it, but it's in the background of the photograph, like it must be in kind of the background of his thoughts a lot of the time. Like, is it time to feed the baby? Yeah, and as Nolan observed, it's an empty bottle, which, which means I've just done that labor fairly recently. Yeah. Um, it looks like Susan is struggling with how to raise her hand. Uh, and I, I don't know how to explain that while I'm in screen share. Yeah. Susan, if you didn't get a prompt, you could also try holding down the space bar while you speak, like a walkie-talkie. 
Well, I unmuted. Did that work? Yeah, you're fine. Tell us, what, tell us what's on your mind. Well, what's on my mind is I'm looking at these and I'm looking at these in this moment in time. And I'm wondering if some of you, I think I understood that these were at the gallery. Yes. I'm wondering how I would be responding differently. I've been uh, isolating since March 6th by myself and paying attention through the television to the Black Lives Matter and all the tragic things that have been happening around the country. And looking at these particular photographs now, I feel a different kind of sense within myself that I don't have words for, that I may be seeing them a little differently now than I would have three months ago. Does that make any sense to anybody else? It, it makes sense, but I'm not sure in what way you feel it, it, that it's different now? Because you mentioned two things. One is isolating by oneself, and the other is, um, as I said at the beginning, we are experiencing both a lot of really traumatic images of the brutalization of black bodies, but also a real newly energized movement to try and create a culture more free, more free of white supremacy than there is now. So I'm not quite sure what, what you think might be different now, given all of those different things, than if you had walked into the gallery in 20, I can't remember if this was up in 2019 or 2018, I think it was 2018, and seen them on the wall. Well, I have a sense that my, the depth of, I, I don't want to, empathy isn't exactly the word I want, but I'm feeling a deeper, more resonating sense of, of empathy, I guess that's the word I'm gonna use, for people who can't be invisible like I can be invisible in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just differently, I think, more deeply touched looking at these now than I would have been looking at them six months ago. It, your phrasing is really um, compelling to me because one of the signs that one sees if you're going to protests right now uh, held by white people is, I see you, I hear you, I'm here for you. And so it is really interesting to think about, you know, I, I write about race, I spend a lot of time thinking about race, but I also understand that for white people in America, particularly in a place like Portland, not seeing race is one of the privileges of whiteness. And it depends what circles you move in and who's in your family and what who you work with and what neighborhoods you're in. So I don't mean to I don't mean to reiterate the narrative that Portland's all white because that's really not true at all. But it but I think that you're right that there um there has been a new found desire to understand and connect that I think is related both to the sense of social isolation many of us had for months of this year and now just wanting to look more accurately at the world and see what we haven't seen before. Um, was uh, is Molly Majors, your hand up again? Wait, you haven't been unmuted yet. Let, let Amanda work her magic. And then Craig is up next. Um, I was just responding to Chuck's mention of the bottle, of the milk bottle. Um, I think it's a, luck, a lucky um, for the balance of the photo. I think it's like perfectly placed. I mean, just on a structural of the photo kind of idea and that he's looking towards it. I mean, that his face is turned in that direction, I think is, is good. Um, but also uh, Susan's comments about um, maybe an, a heightened empathy. I think if you had heard Jun Lee talk about his photos, he's just a magical speaker and um, you would have felt it in the presence two years ago, like you're feeling now. He's, yeah, he's, he's pretty great. Thanks. Yeah, somebody put in the um, chat, it's scrolled by, so I can't remember who it was, that the bottle is like a still life element, 
which is lovely for every new parent to know that like the bottle that you haven't gotten around to washing and sterilizing yet, or as one of my friends said, first baby be sterilized, second baby wiped on t-shirt. Um, <laughs> That, uh, but that you're actually creating a still life. It's not just that you are completely overwhelmed with everything it takes to parent a newborn well. Um, who is up next? Amanda? Okay, Amanda's next. Oh, hi. So, sorry for kind of just dropping in so late. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, oh, the bottle, I think an interesting thing about the bottle is the bottle is empty, which kind of says that the, uh, that the, the, the children have been cared for, you know, that, uh, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, th this, this uh, is a good example. I mean, the different interpretations of one of the kind of special things about photography and the way it deals with time that, that when the picture, you know, the picture was made in a moving world and, and it was just kind of a, this little fraction of a second was, was captured. And, and it may be that the uh, FedEx truck just drove up, you know, <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, but then the, the, the photographer gets to choose, you know, and so I mean every photograph to a certain extent maybe gets to be a Rorschach test a little bit. Uh, and it's not necessarily, you know, the, the meaning is not necessarily what was there originally, but uh, because it may have just been fleeting. Uh, but then because time is now stretched out this, you know, 125th of a second now gets to live infinitely. Uh, uh, we, we get to project into it uh, right. the meaning. So. Yes, yes, for sure. Thank you. Um, I'm realizing we've been talking a long time on just the first three photographs, so I'm sort of interested to move us along to look at some of the poetry. Are you all okay with that? Is there anybody urgently waiting on the photography? No, not anymore. Okay, so I'm going to take us to the first of these poems and life is gonna get a little complicated because it's hard for me to actually see everything on my screen. Um, if we were in the gallery, we would go around and take turns reading stanza by stanza, and that's not possible because it would just take too long to like call on people. So I'm gonna read it through once and then we're gonna do something else to read it again. But I want us to think about, well maybe, yeah. Um, Quickening, 4th of July, Sag Harbor, Long Island. On the beach, the fireworks bloom above us, their boom and brightness, and my goddaughter slips asleep. These days, inside mama, you don't so much kick as wrestle, an elbow, then your butt butting out her belly. We lie by the water and watch the dark, lap the sand and scrub filled shore. Another, ultra another ultrasound shows, you are my son, all right. Head down like a monk, burrowing your profile and pout only I seem to see. When will you arrive to usher us into your arms? It is we who will be born, not you. After the fanfare for the country's birth, the smoke, and strong gunpowder smell to remind us what once was there, we'll walk back home across the dark, unalone. And I didn't ask you, what are the things that we look at or that we think about when we're reading a poem? We talked about the things we think about when we're reading a photograph. What are the things that we think about when we're reading a poem? And you can chat, you can uh, raise a hand. And I mean this more generically than this particular poem. Like once upon a time, somebody told you that poems rhyme, which this sneakily doesn't do very much of. What are the other things? And then you can all say, Lois, we're photography people. You're going to have to help us more with the poem. Um, Molly Major is saying, I think I search for feelings, thoughts I recognize in myself. So kind of similar to the emotional connection we talked about with the photographs. Uh, Amanda, does anybody have a hand up? Yeah, Chris and then Sharon after that. Sharon after that. Sharon after that. Yeah, for me, yeah. Um, there's, there's a, a way of where both writers, whether it's um, poetry or, uh, I mean, 
Raymond Carver was the best at this, I think. Look for, look for some small detail that tells a huge story. And I think that's what photographers do, and I think that's what writers do. And, uh, you know, if Raymond Carver can write a three-page story where you feel like you know the protagonist better than you know anybody in your real life, they're doing a really, he's doing a really good job of finding that detail. To me, that's what I look for in the poem is, is the sort of use of metaphor and sort of this one thing will, will just make the people real and make the situation light up. I think that's especially true for poetry because there is usually, the epic poem notwithstanding, a, a condensation. Is that the word I want? No, that's not the word I want. A concentration. <laughs> in, uh, in, in fewer words, but needing to convey more. And Amanda, remind us who is next. Sharon is next. Thanks. Um, so as much as, um, as much as I like photography books, and I do love photography books, um, I noticed I was leaning towards poetry, and I think it's because oftentimes they're just so, so super visual. So it's a visuality of poetry that I, you know, that I think it goes well with photography. Yeah, and I'll read off some of what folks have put in the chat that Zemi talks about rhythm and sound and how the language flows. And I think uh, Chris's curmudgeon comment about these kids today aren't doing enough formal. I feel like a lot, um, there's an interesting move in poetry because spoken word poetry understands rhythm and uh, sound flow really well, but a lot of people who just write for the page these days, I feel like there's no musicality in their lines, and I love musicality, and we'll talk more about what exactly I mean by that. Um, and Molly also reminded us of imagery, Leland reminded us of metaphor. Zemi says how, visually how the words are put on the page, right? When you're a poet, you can spend four days just deciding whether to end the line at this word or the next word and really like moving that back and forth and moving it back and forth and moving it back and forth. So it's thinking about where line breaks are, where stanza breaks are and how that flows in the page. Um, and uh, Molly Major also said, um, something that brings something into focus that I haven't thought of before. So now, before we start actually talking about this particular poem, especially to get at the musicality, you're all muted, which means we can't hear each other and we can't unmute because it would be cacophonous because of the time delay. But I'm gonna read the poem again and I want each of you, and I can see your mouth so don't cheat, to read it out loud too. And you can read it in a different way than I'm reading it, but I want you to get the feel of the sounds in your mouth because it's really different than reading them on the page. All right, are you ready? Deep breath. Here we go. Quickening. Fourth of July. Sag Harbor. Long Island. On the beach, the fireworks bloom above us, their boom and brightness, and my goddaughter slips asleep. These days, inside mama, you don't so much kick as wrestle, an elbow, then your butt butting out her belly. We lie by the water and watch the dark lap the sand and scrub filled shore. Another ultrasound shows you are my son, all right. Head down like a monk, burrowing your profile and pout only I seem to see. When will you arrive to usher us into your arms? It is we who will be born, not you. After the fanfare for the country's birth, the smoke and the strong gunpowder smell to remind us what once was there, we'll walk back home across the dark, unalone. Okay, so what was it like? What did you notice saying the words of the poem and not just reading them or hearing me read them? Molly Major said, I read it differently than you do. And Molly, can you, um, maybe the Magic Amanda can unmute you and you can tell us how, which is totally fair. My reading is not the right reading. Everybody has their own um, way to read it. So I think I just emphasize some words more than others or slow down in places where you sort of go, go faster. Um, that's all I mean. 
Can um, you give a specific example? Do you remember one? Um, uh, for example, when it says, so I'm not paying attention to their, their spacing, I guess. When you arrive to usher us into your arms, it is we who will be born, not you. After the fanfare for the country's birth, the smoke and strong gunpowder gun smell. And because I do war research, that was really important to me as a son being born into um, a country that seems to be continually at war, that they're gonna to have to face that down the road. Um, yeah, anyway, those, that. Yeah, no, totally fair. And, you know, um, if any of you know the poem, We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks, you can spend like three hours with a group this size with each of us discussing how differently we read that poem because it's super short and it's got um, very short sentences. So figuring out how you do pause and what you emphasize is really fascinating. Uh, who did you say was up next, Amanda? Looks like Chuck is up next. I guess I would say that reading it out loud myself makes the words resonate in a different way in my mind as well as the sort of sound of this having the sound of the, it, my own voice resonate makes the words resonate also. Can you give us some a specific in terms of what the effect of that is? Wow. Um, it's a different process of reading. It's like the, you know, when you read quietly or hear someone reading, you form the images in your mind of what you're hearing or reading. But when you're saying the words out loud, at least for me, I find that the uh, the, it becomes more of a physical experience than a, just a, a intellectual one. Yeah, and for me, I feel like I get a, a more of an emotion, right? Like, my goddaughter slips asleep. That sounds so fun to me. I love those words in my mouth because slips asleep. Um, the softness of those. And then these days inside mama, you don't so much kick as wrestle, right? So slips asleep is so soft in my mouth and the kick is a harder sound. Oh, but this child isn't kicking, he's wrestling. An elbow, right back to those soft sounds. Um, and we can start to expand this beyond the, the reading out loud to other things that you guys talked about, metaphors, similes, um, symbolism, other things that you see in the poem. But Amanda, tell us who's up next. Chris is up next and then Molly Newgard after that. Yeah, for me, it, the main difference is it turns me from a passive recipient into an active participant to be reading it aloud. And, and I think that's something that I see a lot when we're looking at photographs. It's like, does the photograph leave you in a position of, as an outside person saying, oh, what is this person trying to tell me? Or do you say, oh, wait a minute, look what's going on in this picture. What can I figure out? The way we were just doing with Jun's pictures, we were looking at these and trying to understand the scene. We were active explorers. So I feel like reading it aloud puts me in more in that headspace and role. And if all of you had taken your history of Renaissance literature while you were taking your history of Renaissance art classes, we might be talking about this poem as a lyric poem, right? That it is, and that um, is very much a Renaissance form. The lyric is the first person speaking, which is interesting here too, because the first person moves back between the single and the plural. It seems it is sometimes the I of the father talking to this, uh, in utero child, and it is sometimes the we uh, that, you know, we lie by the water and watch the dark, we'll walk back home, so that there's also um, the couple, but this larger family unit that's implied there. And whenever you read something out loud that's in the first person, it does, I think, Chris, as you were saying, kind of, it makes it, it makes you part of the experience in a different way because you are saying the I and you are saying the we. Um, was there somebody up next, Amanda? Yeah, Molly next. Yeah, in fact, my, um, my comment is very similar um, in, in feeling like I am stepping into this 
seen and I'm kind of taking ownership over it as I read these these words that become my me mine and my experience. So very similar to what you were both saying. I um I don't know by 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 reciting it by taking ownership over the first person you 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 build that connection. Um so yeah I felt I felt that too. And so what are, in terms of metaphor, simile, imagery, or those other elements we talked about more generally in poems, what are the things that you're noticing in this particular poem? Chris is noticing the head down like a monk, right? Like, it's such a funny thing to hear a father say about a son on an ultrasound. You are my son, all right. Head down like a monk. <laughs> but also, um, so what do we make of that comparison? And then the saying, pout only I seem to see. What is it, like, what are we supposed to make about that? Of that? What is it? Um, telling you about the speaker of this poem. I think Molly Newgard is up. Um, so the pout only I seem to see. Um, I think that talks about the, the connection between parent and child, um, even before the child is, is born. Um, there's something that's that's innate and something that is detected um, even before they're ushered into, into the arms. So I think, I think very powerful, very powerful. Uh, and Molly Major has said in the chat, projecting, right? Also projecting in a, in a sweet way that is also a kind of self-awareness slash self-mockery, right? Like, <laughs> Oh, that's me, <laughs> right? Um, on the, the part of the poet. I just looked at my watch and realized we've been at this a long while and I thought we were gonna work, go through things much more quickly, but maybe should we do one more poem? Are people still good for one more poem? I thought we were gonna get to more poems, more photographs. How are you feeling? Okay, one more poem. Um, expecting, and this poem comes before the one we just looked at in the, in the book, but I thought uh, might, it might be easier to start with the one that we just started with. And I have to move all my little things around so I can see more of the page. Expecting, grave, my wife lies back, hands cross. Oh, feel free to read along if you would like to do that at home, uh, because now you know you can. Expecting, grave, my wife lies back, hands cross her chest, while the doctor searches early for your heartbeat, peach pit, unripe plum, pulls out the world's worst boombox, a Mr. Microphone, to broadcast your mother's lifting belly, the whoosh and bellows of mama's body, and beneath it, nothing. Beneath the slow stutter of her heart, nothing. The doctor trying again to find you, fragile, fern, snowflake, nothing. After, my wife will say, in fear, impatient, she went beyond her body, this tiny room into the ether. For now, we spelunk for you one last time, lost canary, miner of coal and chalk, lungs not yet black. I hold my wife's feet to keep her here, and me, trying not to dive, starboard, to see you in the dark water, and there it is, faint, an echo, faster and further away than mother's, all beatbox and fuzzy feedback. You are like hearing hip hop for the first time. Power hijacked from a lamppost, all promise. You couldn't sound better, break dancer, my favorite song bumping from a passing car. You snuck into the club underage and stayed, only later, much will your mother 
begin to believe your drumming in the distance. Our Kansas City and Congo Square, this jazz band vamping on inside her. So you can, I, I hope maybe see in the same way we see with Zoom's poetry, or with Zoom's photography, that there's a style and a body of work, even though there's a lot of variation from one piece to the next. And the same, I think, here with these two examples of Kevin's poems. Um, so what are the things that strike you about this poem or questions that you have about them, about it? Molly, all, all Molly's have said emotional roller coaster, both fear and excitement. So that's the emotion of the poem for sure. What are some of the specific ways that as a poet, he's conveying that to us? Think about those. I mean, this one is loaded with metaphors and similes. Sharon says so much about listening. And feel free to raise your hands so that the uh, grand Amanda can unmute you. But it's not, there's listening, right? So it starts off with this very literal listening for the sound of the heartbeat and, and also really very quickly going to the fear, right? That it's searching for a sound that at first they don't hear, but then, sound starts coming in in all of these metaphorical ways or through the metaphors there's a whole other bunch of sounds we start thinking about here right um looks like leland wants to jump in there's a there's a lot of alliteration in this um you know in the second stanza plum pulls world's worst, boom box, Mr. Microphone. There's a lot of this kind of repetitive consonant sounds at the beginnings of words, um, almost, which gives it this, in, because they're in rapid fire, it's almost like a chant. Um, mm -hmm. There's also something about both of these poems that I've been thinking about, which is that they're both told from a father's perspective. And so the physical sensation is interpreted by somebody other than the person really experiencing it. A lot of references to what's going on inside mommy's body. And, and so there's this perception of somebody else experiencing something in a different way. Yeah, and, and even sort of what the relationship is. So in a poem, we would talk formally about the addressee, who's, who's the voice of the poem speaking to. And in both of these poems, it's speaking to this in utero, child but here we have grave my wife lies back in the first line the last line and that what i've made the first column is i hold my wife's feet to keep her here but there are other places where that same person is described as mama or mother right so like even this negotiation of like what the relationships are is getting worked out, I think, over the course of the poem. And you're right, this, he is um, a poet who is always very conscious of sound and often sound repetition. And even thinking about peach, right, peach pit, unripe plum, those are tied together by sounds. It's also, they're all fruits, and that's gonna be really different than the kind of imagery we see in other places in the poem. Um, is somebody up next, Amanda? Yes, looks like Judah's up next. Um, I'm reading this poem and thinking of my own experience, you know, having the first ultrasound. And I think for the mother, it becomes pretty real pretty quick. You know, if you have morning sickness or, or whatever, you're aware 
that you're carrying this child inside of you. But I think, well, certainly for my husband, it wasn't real until we actually had the first ultrasound and he could hear the heartbeat. And um, the beginning of the, the poem seems sort of uh, tentative. You know, we're not sure if, if you're okay. We're not sure if you're really there. We're a little fearful and then we hear the heart and, and it's almost celebratory then. I think for sure. But one of the things that's really striking about this, um, and if it is the like, she's scared, he's scared, the, the doctor searches, is searching for the heartbeat, that repetition of the word nothing, nothing, nothing. It's like never is the word nothing more horrible than at yeah. this kind of moment, right? Searching for a heartbeat, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then we move in time, right? After my wife will say, in fear, impatient, she went beyond her body. So he can't experience what she's experiencing at this moment. He tells us through this fake telling of the fetus what she later tells him she was experiencing at this moment. It's like if we had to diagram that on a chart, it would be incredible that she is so scared. She goes beyond her body that he is also scared, but is holding her to keep her there, right? Um, and that interestingly, as you say, it gets much more hopeful and celebratory in the last part of the poem. But interestingly, I think the experience you describe is more typical that um, when a couple is uh, going through a pregnancy, the one who's pregnant can feel what's happening in the way that the other one can't. But for her, there is greater disbelief here, right? Only later, much, will your mother begin to believe you're drumming in the distance, right? So that this fear that is in, captured in this one moment of nothing, 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 seems to stay with her longer. And if, you've re if you read the whole book of poetry, which is a fantastic book, they have already experienced at least one miscarriage at this point. So that, that fear, I think, is... Uh -huh heightened often. Um, did Molly Newgard have her hand up and then take it down? Sorry, I had to leave for a minute. Um, well, I was thinking about some of the, you know, I first wrote emotional roller coaster and then you ask us to kind of find places where, like how, how, did, how did he do that? How does he do that? Um, and so I'm just, you know, looking at some of the imagery like we spelunk for, we, for you one last time, lost canary, minor, of coal and chalk. I mean, something like that, that's so, vi you know, so visceral. Um, but then I'm thinking as you were just talking, Lois, about kind of the momentum that builds and what, where we're going with this poem and just the way in which it goes from this desperation to something so promising. And you he even uses that word promise and like hearing hip hop for the first time. Like that's, I mean, that's just, yeah, it's really, um, and then, and then the way that the that that the mother will will begin to believe that that drumming and that that the reality through through the music through you know it will come to her that this is actually something that has come to fruition. So it's just it's yeah it's amazing. And you know, like I really have never thought that the perfect simile for that ultrasound is like hearing hip hop for the first time, right? This is such a great set of similes and metaphors that he puts out there for us. Um, and, and I think it's hard for people who have not had this experience of hip hop, right? That this hip hop really is literally the music of the streets. You're not, you don't have a club. I mean, these days you might, you don't have a, a recording studio these days you might, but the original hip hop was performed, created on the streets, literally with power jacked from a lamppost, right? So this sense of community, of exposure, of danger, but also of literally seizing power to get your words and your sounds out there is like its own fantastic universe. And now here it is. You are like hearing hip hop for the first time. Power hijacked from a lamppost, all promise before corporate recording companies uh, will appropriate you. Uh, you couldn't sound better 
rake dancer, another great thing to say about like the image that might show up on the ultrasound, break dancer, my favorite song, bumping from a passing car, maybe more of an experience we have all had. You've snuck into the club underage and stayed, like now he's not letting this metaphor go. <laughs> and yet it ships, right? We were in hip hop land. We were on the street, then it was coming out of a passing car, then it was in the club and we had to sneak into the club because we weren't old enough, we were with the kid, we totally have this experience. And then he shifts it, he stays with music. But when he says our Kansas City, one of the birthplaces of jazz, and I will expose the fact that Kevin, I think his wife are actually both from Kansas, though they didn't meet there, and Congo Square, which is in New Orleans, this jazz band vamping on inside her. So now I'll ask you the sort of provocative devil's advocate question I love to ask. Is Kevin Young a terrible poet? Like, is there a problem with the fact that he starts with a hip hop metaphor and then he moves on to a jazz metaphor? Is that like clunky and he needed to stick with one? Or shall we assume that Kevin Young is one of the most prolific and, uh, have I shown my resentment about that enough? Prolific and lauded poets of, of my generation got something right here. How can you move from hip hop to jazz with it not being a great old big mess, but instead being very carefully crafted, artful hand? That was a big question I just asked. Looks like Chuck's got something to say. Well, I guess if you were talking about them both as musical forms, you could say that they're both about being created in the moment and in improvisation, right? So there's a certainly this, there's a kind of connection um, about the kind of music, but you wonder about how that relates to someone's heartbeat or what this, you know, the spirit of a human being, I guess. And they're both quintessentially African-American forms of music. I mean, that doesn't mean people don't create hip hop or jazz or play those genres or sing those genres who aren't African-American, but they come out of this culture in particular. So he's also invoking a cultural lineage. You, you are already coming into a cultural lineage, a cultural production. You are already an inheritor of this great legacy, even at this moment. Is anybody else winning, Amanda? Yes, Chris. Yeah, I just want to say I really like uh, when he talks about this uh, this fetus's music as vamping, because vamping is 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 kind of what the band does when it's like okay, some soloist is going somewhere we don't know where they're going, you know. So it's kind of like marking time, and it's a, typically a sort of a short, uh, repeating musical phrase, you know. It's kind of you know, the horns kind of come in with a burp, 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 you know, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, I think that's a wonderful thing to think about this, this person who's not born yet, who's not, who's not going to take their solo for a while yet. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're part of the band and they're playing and they're on stage. And I just, I like it. I think it's really smart. Yeah. And again, we see them moving from like, my wife, we, this family, you are already vamping on Insider. And you're right, we're just like waiting for this kid to take his solo. So we have, this has been fantastic. And we have talked much longer than I thought we would on much less of the content that I put together. I won't even tell you how many other photos and poems I had ready. Um, but maybe we just to wrap up, because I know folks need to go, and some have already left us, um, could talk a little bit about how has our image of black fatherhood, how does it, how, do, how are we creating that or deepening our understanding of it across the photographs and across the poems that we've looked at? And there's no reason for it uh, not to be able to see each other at this point. So what, if we're thinking not just of individual photos or individual poems, what are we building in our understanding? Oh, um, hey, I think um, if, if there was just more of this for everybody, like in all communities, like if there's just more of this 
interface, <clears throat> we'd all be better off. And we wouldn't be just thinking about, you know, the the violence versus the good, the good and bad, you know, because this is the middle zone that's massive, that stretches between, you know, the good and the, the evil or, you know, and where we all lie or how we think about each other. So, you know, if there's just a lot more of this integrated, needs to be integrated across all levels, across all schools, across, you know, in the education, and then that changes everything. It changes how you do perceive, how we perceive each other. And it looks like Leland's waiting to jump in. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting because I think that there, in the conversations that I have with a lot of my black and I'm, I'm in Montana, so a lot of native friends, there's, there's idea that white people dehumanize people that we don't see as of ourselves. And um, I think, I think all of the photographs and the poems have, have really kind of done a great job of rehumanizing people in, in that sense, um, giving us a sense of how much like ourselves they are, that it's not a, it's not a distinction of race. It's, it's something that is just human about all of us, this relationship to our children. Um, and yet at the same time, making us aware of some of those, um, ideas. And I, you know, a, a lot of my friends have, have been very quick to point out that that is racism, <laughs> right? I mean, that is, that is what racism is, is noticing that. And that's when you stop saying, I'm not a racist and you go, oh, I guess I am a racist because I've been seeing these things. But you know, the, these, these kinds of things, unlike an argument, unlike a confrontation, they, they give you a sense of how to question your own mindset about other people. And, um, and I, I think, I think it's really, I think poetry and photography and art in general is a really important and compelling way for us to challenge ourselves, um, and to, and to look at people differently. And I think there's also a lot of history in what you're talking about. Like when, when you talk about, uh, the experience of African Americans, like the joke is just say slavery because so much of what is happening in any given moment is rooted in enslavement. And certainly when you say like not seeing people as fully human, the whole notion of slavery is based on treating blacks as though they were not human, like oxen or horses or cattle that you could buy and sell and work to death, right? And with Native Americans, there's something parallel going on, which is often about also constructing them as animals, but animals that you can ex exploit, right? You can extinctify them in the same way that you can extinctify the buffalo or the whatever, because they occupied the land, but now we're gonna civilize the land and have towns and civilization on the land. And so we just rid ourselves of whatever species were there before. And those are really different kinds of racism. They performed together really well in the 19th century, in the 18th century, and they continue to perform together in our own century. Um, but I think that using the word human, Chuck told me, he noticed that at some of the rallies we've been attending, people keep talking about using the word human to say, this young human, this 23-year-old human, Elijah McLean, who was murdered by the police, right? The just using the word human is so powerful. Um, it looks like Chris has a hand up, and then I want to just close by showing one last image and letting you all go about your lives. So, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say that we were talking about this a little bit in our board meeting, but you know that photography has this special role, which it lets you look at the world through somebody else's eyes. So, when somebody like Chun Li says, "Why doesn't why don't people see what I see?" He then has this medium photography where he can let people actually look at the world through his eyes and. And he specifically wanted to be looking at it from a vintage point, vantage point of being inside these, these families. So he just spent years becoming part of the family of a number of families. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a way in which, you know, when we're talking about the poetry, when you read it aloud, it becomes this active thing. And, and Lois talked about, you know, now, now I'm saying I, describing myself as a black man having this experience with a 
with a baby in utero. And that's very powerful to put yourself in, you know, to walk a mile in their shoes, you know, I mean, in, in the most literal way. So I think it's, I, I agree with Leland. I think it's really important part of art's job is to teach each other how to notice each other's shared humanity. Yeah, and I, in some ways you have wonderfully set up the last image that I wanted to show. I have to figure out how to make this do this. Voila. Um, and I'm sorry we don't have more time to talk about this, so instead I'm just gonna tell you what I think about this picture because I love this picture so much as I do so many of his photographs. I think um, in part the strength, and this is, uh, Jarell Willis. So this is the same two people that we saw, two humans that we saw in that first image standing in the corner of uh, the rooftop. And now we get to see this child's eyes and that kid looks so happy. And I think of the sense of safety and protection. I did not have a particularly good father. So I am in love with this photo, I think in part because I'm in love with the idea of a father who has who is as protective and caring as this father is and whose child can feel as cared for as this child does. Um, and to me, this father is also like, I feel like there's a, an angel quality about the, you know, I can, um, I can see the wings coming out of the, um, this angel father, but also I love that this father is really heavily tattooed, that he's wearing that hat that I, and confronting in this photograph the very way in which it is so easy in our culture as a white person to write off black bodies, black male bodies, tattooed black male bodies, tattooed black male bodies in a particular kind of hat. And that the first thing that you think about is not, what a loving father. I wish my father had been like this father, that this photograph is confronting and even as it is celebrating. Um, and if you don't look at black bodies that way, if you look at black bodies and expect that they are loving, caring people, this photograph still works. It's still an amazing photograph. I love that it says Brooklyn as we are crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, it is to me, it speaks to that like, yo New Yorker, we are home and we are here. That is really awesome. So I just did the thing I try never to do, which is to give myself the last word, but I really wanted to leave you with this image in part because I think, again, it, it can push some things and celebrate other things in ways that are super important. And I wish we could talk about it for another half an hour, but everybody needs to go, it's hot, we haven't had dinner. Um, are there any Blue Sky announcements that Blue Sky wants to officially make? Yes, I would like to say that next month um, in August, we're having a, uh, we're donating a portion of our sales from the Northwest Drawers to the Black Resilience Fund and to Sisters of the Road. Um, that information went out in our email on Monday. So if you don't get our emails, which I actually presume most of you found out about this event via that, but um, stay tuned for more information and, um, about that too, yeah. Well, thank you all for another superb, provocative, important evening. Thank you, thank you Lois. Okay. Fare thee well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Bye. 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 Oh, it's Thank <laughs> you.